Friends, hey, hi, how are you? It's Leo WT here, live from Puerto Rico, just trying to get myself together here. Um, but I wanted to share with you something that I've been studying, right? So part of my promise as I've been going through grad school is that I would share with you the things that I'm also studying. And so again, I'm doing a little bit of a mashup here. Um, so today you get to learn about a little bit about systematic theology and the intersection of science and theology uh, via the platform of conversations. So I'm going to make a little short video and I'm going to drop all of my citations at the end. So since this is for class, there's going to be some big words and there's definitely going to be citations but i wanted to share them with you folks because i think you should know that i'm not just popping off right that's a good thing to know <clears throat> so the idea here behind this project is i'm working on a research project where i'm talking about the intersection of science and theology and I know a lot of people don't think that those two things go together, but they actually do. And my professor, Dr. Joanne Terrell, uh, and my school, Chicago Theological Seminary, are actually working on a project to talk about the intersection of theology and science. So I wanted to add my hat to that ring because people think all the time that science and theology don't go together, but people think all the time also that queerness and theology don't go together, and they totally do. And so what I wanted to talk about a little bit is like how we got to the point of queer theology. And I think there's a very distinct moment in scientific history that allowed for the generation and explosion of queer theology. And like I said, most people don't think those things go together, but they actually do. And so here's what I wanted to share with you. So the word homosexual wasn't put in the Bible until 1946, which isn't so much a scientific fact, it's a literary fact. But the reason that it ended up being put in the Bible was because the word, you know, homosexuality wasn't really codified until the 1940s. And at that point, homosexuality became pathologized. What that meant is homosexuality was defined as the scientific and medical phenomenon. Uh, before that, the word homosexual didn't exist. It was not pathologized. The idea of pathology is like when something is classified medically, right? And so when homosexuality was classified medically, it created a wave of really passionate anti-queer uh, hermeneutics in the church. And what happened was once that word homosexuality was created by the medical and scientific community, it gave the religious community words to use to put in the Bible to discriminate against queer people. And so in that way, the scientific evolution of the study of orientation and also gender, uh, as it would be linked later, but that, that scientific study directly shaped the way that theology went. What's interesting about that is in the 1940s, right around 1946, you start to see a lot of passionately anti-LGBTQ theology. Before that, as John Boswell argues in his, books, uh, in his book Christianity, Homosexuality and uh, History, John Boswell argues that in the ancient world, there wasn't actually a massive anti-LGBTQ attitude. We say this admitting that LGBTQ is a modern term. So literary and historical, what's the difference? Um, but yeah, so John Boswell writes in his book that there wasn't actually massive anti-LGBTQ attitudes in early Christianity and in the ancient world. Uh, that's to say homophobia and transphobia were not a part of the game originally, and they came about later. And I think that when science codified homosexuality as a pathology or as a disease, that really created the shift in the church where we started talking so negatively about homosexuality. And that bled in to the translation of the Bible in 1946, uh, which was put in the uh, NR... NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, uh, there's a film coming out about that particular transition called 1946, the documentary. But also, you know, in the 40s, you started to see people really developing an apologetic of anti-LGBTQ scriptures. What that means is people were taking Bible verses specifically to use them against queer people. That couldn't have happened before because the word homosexuality wasn't in the Bible before. So it couldn't have been discussed before, but this is where we really start to see people using uh, New Testament books to condemn LGBTQ people to hell. But what also happens simultaneously uh, is something that's actually really amazing. And in that fertile space for hatred came the field of queer theology. 
queer theology is the understanding of theology that transcends a binary. So it's not necessarily just uh, LGBTQ theology, but what it is is theology that defies binary categorization. And so once you started delineating and pathologizing homosexuality, you also see the rise in queer theology. And you see that with theologians like Marcella Althus Reed. Um, you've got some more modern theologians like Dr. Robert Shore Goss, Dr. Ken Stone, um, all sorts of other theologians who I'll list uh, in the comments below. But they started to bring out these ideas of queer theology and bring them to the surface. But what's interesting is that queer theologians existed all throughout history. Uh, in John Boswell's book about Christianity and homosexuality in the early church, uh, he talks about the, how there were saints that were queer. There were major founding theologians of the church that were queer. I believe it was Origen, who was a major church father, who was actually rumored to be queer. Um, so there is queer theology and there's queer history people all throughout the history of the church, but once you see that pathologizing of homosexuality in the 40s, you start to see these two different theological roads develop. One is an apologetic road that's telling people you are wrong if you're homosexual, you're wrong if you're queer, so you see an anti-LGBTQ attitude. But from the 40s on, you see the development of queer theology, which is a pro-queer approach to the reading of the Bible. And when I say pro-queer, I mean an approach that says, hey, it's good. It's actually good to be queer and you can learn something about God from this queerness. And from that we see people starting to really have a voice in church history. As a fun little fact, I did learn that there, is, there was a, some Christian writers in the, as early as the 1920s who were writing about a queer ethic of theology. One of these such writers I'm gonna pull her up for us right now. Um, but in the there's a book I found last night and it is called Devotions and Desires. And this book is actually talking about queerness in early Christianity. And one of the things that she brings up, I believe it's called Devotions and Desires, Sexuality in the 20th Century. And one of the things that the writer brings up is a Christian missionary from the early 1920s named Winifred Weigel, W-Y-G-A-L. And she talks, uh, the author of this essay is Kathy Kern, and she talks about how in the 20s, Winifred Weigel was actually creating a queer ethic of same-sex desire, uh, polyamory, and Christian faith as early as the 1920s. So we start to see these attitudes come to life where, you know, people might say, oh, Christianity is anti-LGBTQ, which is something that started only in the 40s. But in that pathologizing of anti-LGBTQ attitudes by the creation of the word homosexual, we actually see that those negative attitudes in a weird way fanned the flames for queer theologians that had existed throughout the history of the church. Uh, we see queer church fathers like Gregory of Nyssa. Uh, we see queer church um, activists like Winifred Weigel. We see, uh, and those those are early, you know, early uh, people in the church. And then we see people up until today, like Marcella Althaus Reed, uh, who does some great work about God, um, or, you know, God being, or Jesus being divinity and drag. We see Dr. Robert Shore Goss tying together a queer ethic and an ecological ethic. We see Pat Patrick Chang writing about queer theology, Lynn Marie Tonstead, who's a current professor of queer theology. In a way, the pathologizing of anti-LGBTQ attitudes actually served to build the discipline of queer theology. Thanks for listening, my friends. I'm going to drop some citations in the comments. I hope you have a great day. Bye.